But so part numbers, uh, super straightforward. There's a bunch of part numbers for like TVs, I think it is. I don't think I have to explain what they are. They classify stuff. We need to submit our own part numbers to FSAE when we go to competition. Uh, that's all I have to say on that really. Pretty straightforward. Um, so for us, our part numbers are under this nomenclature. I think uh, I might have shown you guys it during one of the general meetings, but I want to go into depth right now. So the full title is OG number number, letter letter, then five numbers, or a letter in five numbers, followed by the name of your part in all caps. So OG stands for Ocopogo, which was made back in well, 2015 or whatever it was. Then the next number, the two X's that uh, designate the year. So last year, the competition happened May 2023, so the number was 23. This year, it's May 2024, so it's going to be 24. The orange is what subteam it is. FR is for frame, EN is for engine, SU is suspension, BR is for brakes. Uh, there's a bunch of them uh, I can show you in a second. And then the last five are the most important. So if it's a part, it's just numbered from 0, 0, 0, 0, 1 onward. And if it's an assembly, it's labeled from A number, number, number 1 onward. Why is the subteam code? Each subteam has their own number to designate it. I think chassis arrow is two, powertrains one, kin might be three. Uh, I'll have to check in a second. The, diff the reason why we use the subteam number as well as the uh, orange FREN numbers or letters, uh, because in your subteam, you could be working on something that involves another component. So even if you're in powertrain, you might work on something that's suspension. And so your number powertrain is uh, one in the light blue. So it would be OG24SU for suspension, but dash one for under powertrain and then your numbers. If you're on the drive, if you go to Mark 5, Docs and Resources, because it's for this year, it's right there. And so when you open it, this sheet contains the lit running list of all of our parts. So there's like the quick guide at the top. You can see that powertrain is one, aero chassis two, Kimax three, electrical four, miscellaneous is zero, fasteners is nine. Uh, and then it gives a list of various things that would fall under those categories. Uh, frame being FR, same with aero, engine being EN, uh, da, 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 da. Kinemax having the most, ST being steering, SU being suspension, BR being brakes, EL being electrical, MS being miscellaneous, FS being fasteners. If it's an electrical fastener, it would be OG24, FS-4, whatever numbers it is. And then if you go on to your parts, a little powertrain for an example, uh, these are a bunch of assemblies. So it, when you start off, you can go in and say, hey, Here's 24, it is drivetrain, it's an assembly file, it gives it the A designation and that's gonna be your part number is that column. And when you name your thing in CAD, it's gonna be the part number followed by the full capital title block for your part. Uh, you would put whoever designed it if it's final um, or if it's uh, in design phase, if, if it's made you're not using it anymore, you can make it obsolete so no one looks at it again. And then if it's a part uh, like this one, you can say that it's gonna be a part, not an assembly. It gets rid of the A, it slides the one over, final, CBR, that's the engine, made by Honda, that's their part number. And then powertrain added a mixed material column. I don't think any of the other ones have that. They're all kind of in varied states. Last year, I just copied over the fasteners table. It ended up looking like this at the end of the year. So you'll end up having a lot added to the table. But you'll refer to this whenever making your parts. So first things first, you want to make a part and you're like, all right, I need to make something, uh, but I need to give it a name first before I even open it, right? Because when you go on to NX and you're like, okay, I want to make something new. Uh, it's going to be a model, millimeters under modeling. I'm going to name it something. What am I going to name it? 
well, I'm going to go over here and I'm going to say chassis part because I was chassis back in the day and I'll make it, I'll make it part six to nine. So FR frame part, it was designed by myself. It is going to be in a design phase because I just started it and it's going to be called block practice thing. And that's as easy as that. That number is now claimed. You're the owner of it, and you can use that name how you like on your parts. If you want to claim a bunch of them, you can just put your name down for a bunch, put the names what you want to put them on, and then those numbers are claimed. And then when someone else goes to make a part, they look at the sheet and say, oh, I can't use such and such number uh, because someone else has already claimed it. Don't do what I just did and stick it way down the list. Always go next in line and then use it. Uh, this is a carryover. You'll want it look more like this because when someone goes onto your sheet, they're like, oh, I want to make a part number. Uh, I'm going to go down, click that, and I know that I'm not taking anyone else's number and I'm going to go down the list. If you show something way down here, one, I'm not going to see it immediately and I might not think of it as a part number that I should take into consideration. And so when I submit this later on, I might neglect to look over this whole sheet down to the bottom and say, oh, there was something down here. I forgot to submit that. So always try to submit things in order down the list. Uh, yeah, don't adjust the year. Uh, you can adjust the subteam label in the assembly if it's a part or assembly. Uh, write your name, write the whole name. And at the end of it, you'll end up with this as the description. So for my case, I called it OG24FR269 block practice thing. And when I go to an X, I should call this part OG24-FR-269, two being for chassis arrow, space, block, practice, thing. I can save it wherever I want to save it. And there we go. So that's how you get your part number name. Uh, pretty straightforward. Fasteners talk. So there's the definition. If you didn't know, mechanical device joins things together. Non-permanently is the big one. So welding is not a fastening method because welding joins things together permanently. And you could say, oh, well, it's not permanent. I can rip it apart. That ripping action is destructive, which means that it's not a fastener, which I find interesting. A screw is considered a fastener, but the act of putting a screw into a block of wood is destructive. When you take it out, you are putting a hole in something. There's a lot of different fasteners. I think the majority of them that you'll actually, you'll actually use in the club. This long one right here is called a carriage bolt, the flat head. Uh, this is a nylock nut or, yeah, nylock nut. I'll pop this back up. I think it's worth asking. I really hope everyone passes this. Left or right, which one is a screw? Which one is a nail? Hands up for... Something maybe not everyone knows, though. Do you know the names of the three of those common screwdrivers? Yeah. Phillips, Flathead, and Robertson. Sometimes I get lazy and just say square. But yeah, those are the most common ones. Isn't Robertson Cana like a Canadian? It was made by a Canadian, I think. That's good. I'm glad you guys knew that. I'm really happy right now. Of course, there's also other things like Allen keys and whatnot, but that's good. I'm really happy. Okay. Uh, do you guys know like the material or structural difference between using screws and nails? Screws are great for this kind of stress, right? Screws are terrible at this kind. And in that case, you want to use a nail. And then we'll, a nail will bend. A screw will break and shear. We're not using wood very often, we're using metals. So we use bolts instead. Bolts are most common in our case. So this year we're using metric fasteners, uh, metric bolts primarily. So it's important to recognize if you see a bunch of lines on bolts, it's definitely imperial. Uh, so imperial, the six sides, really common in the shop. We used imperial last year, so if you see them hanging around, grade eight imperial bolts were really, really common. But for metric bolts, that at the top there, the M8-1.25 times 30 is 
the designation does know what size of bolt it is. So M8, it always starts with an M. 8 indicates the diameter of the bolt. 1.25 indicates the thread pitch. So if it's 1.25 or 1.75, the threads will be different pitch. I think. Uh, say it again, but same thing. Times 30, the length of it is 30 millimeters. Um, and then that bottom number where it says like 5.8, 8.8, 9.8, and 10.9 is the grade of the bolt and it indicates how strong it is. Uh, this here, I'll show you guys the rule book in a second, but all critical fasteners are 8.8 .8 or stronger. Um, and so you'll see that in a second. Yeah, when you find nuts, you just have to match like M8 and then the thread pitch. Uh, you might want to consider how tall the, the nut is because uh, after you put your bolt through a part or through two parts, you have a little bit of thread exposed. If your nut's this big, it's not going to thread fully. Uh, always have at least two threads poking out the end of your nut. It's one of the rules as well as just good practice because sometimes after vibrations and movement, things start to slip. This is where critical fasteners come in. So critical fasteners say really, really important stuff. I don't want these fasteners. I don't want these fasteners to get loose and then the, the nut just falls off and it gets loose and like falls out, things break. Uh, and instead, critical fasteners say even if it gets loose, uh, you're not allowed to fall apart. It's got to stay together in some manner. Metric grade 8.8 .8 under rule T.8.2.1 is the one we'll be using most often probably, that or stronger. T.8.2.3, hopefully you guys have read a fair amount of the rules book. Positive locking mechanisms. So there's a few different positive locking ones. The ones they mentioned are safety wiring, cotter pins, nylocks, locks, and prevailing torque nuts. These ones are probably used the least, I'm guessing. Um, Safety wiring, you tie your bolts so that when they try to loosen, the cable tie will try to resist it. So say I screw this on this way. When I tighten it with my safety wire, I'll tighten it so that it wants to, it will want to loosen up that way. So I'll tighten it this way around and like that, so that even if it wants to loosen, it will pull against it and it won't keep spinning around. Uh, cotter pins, you put a pin through it and say, don't move, and it won't move. And then nylock is <laughs> what's on the uh, screen there. So it looks like a normal nut, but you can identify them in the shot from a distance if you see this extra kind of like lumpy round bit on top of it. You can kind of see an example where it just kind of like comes in, you get this weird tower at the top. And if you look inside it, sometimes they're blue, sometimes they're yellow, they're different colors. That inside colored ring is nylon, which is why they're called nylocks. So as you bolt it and tighten it on, your threads uh, go around the nut as usual, but once they hit the nylon, it grabs on and it acts kind of like a screw where it starts cutting through the nylon and then it grips it so that it doesn't want to come undone. It has better friction than just the pure nut. Uh, the big issue with those, under heat, the nylon will melt. It doesn't do well in heat and it will lose its uh, attachment and so it will come undone and then that will fall off. So you have to use safety wiring and carter pins or this guy prevailing torque lock nuts uh, and circumstances where you're near really high heat, which isn't often when it comes to critical fasteners. The majority of them are in low heat zones, but it's worth thinking about. Uh, so I want to show you guys McMaster. Uh, I love McMaster. It's so nice. If you look up McMaster car, you'll be taken to this website. On it is literally, you can buy everything. It's fantastic. There's, it's like a machinist or an engineer's dream. You got it all here. First and foremost, screws and bolts right there at the top. If you click it, it gives you a ton of options to click through. Oops, if I actually click it this time. There we go. 
Uh, first things first, are we in imperial or metric? We are in metric. And then from there, we can choose uh, the diameter, length, uh, what type it is, uh, thread pitch and stuff. So I'll say I want to get, all right, so we've given a list of fasteners here. We need to narrow it down a little bit more. Um, fully threaded versus partially threaded. So if you have something that's really long that you're putting the bolt through, kind of like in this example, where there's a lot of material, use a partially threaded. It'll go through smoother. It won't grab as much. And really, you're only paying for this amount of thread. You don't care about the thread that you're not seeing. It's a little cheaper in that case, if you think of it that way. But you don't need thread in there. If you're using a bunch of different, like, things in between, maybe go for a full thread. Up to you, I'll say partially threaded for this example. You can choose your different materials, um, aluminum, brass, nylon, stainless steel, and steel. Uh, once you choose your grade, it's definitely gonna be steel, so 8.8 .8 is the minimum for critical fasteners. Uh, immediately, the only option you have is steel. If it wasn't a critical fastener, you'd have these options. Uh, can anyone think of a reason why you wouldn't want a fastener to be made out of aluminum, brass, or nylon as compared to a steel. If what well, your design doesn't need a whole lot of stress in that case, you can, you're okay with using a brass fastener. You're like, yeah, this will work. Uh, let's say something like cosmetic or something that's not structurally like loaded. Uh, the firewall, for example, used aluminum thumb screws, but that was a bad idea. The reason why <laughs> that was a bad idea one, it's the last thing to go in the car, really, when you put it together, it's like, okay, that was the last thing, we're done. But if you mess up putting a little tiny thumb screw in made of aluminum and it falls into the car, um, you can't get it back again. And so with steel, we have these magnet sticks, like little telescopic sticks. You reach in, you pull it out, handy dandy. If it's not magnetic, we don't have really long tweezers so you have to take the car apart, <laughs> find this thing, put it back together, and then hopefully not do it a second time, because it's, <laughs> which I, oh, God. This is, this is from experience. <laughs> Last year, Mark IV had aluminum thumb screws all over the place, and I kept dropping them, and it, oh my God. Let's do steel. Let's do steel for most things, especially if they're really small and dainty. Otherwise, you can use the other ones. But yeah, if you're using... 8.8 or higher, this one says 10.9. Of course, there's the other one, the 12.9. Um, it might not show them all because of the diameter and length that I chose. It's a fairly skinny bolt, kind of long. So probably not very common, but here we go. And then you get whatever. If you go over here and say, I want a zinc-plated 8.8 .8 steel bolt, sure. Pack of 50 of them for 11 bucks, sounds good to me. You click this. It gives you the option to download it. If I went and chose IGES for NX, that's amazing. I could download that. While that's downloading, I'll go back to NX. File, open, downloads. Uh, I want to have all files. There it is. .IGS. Give it a second. So it converts the IGS to a .part file, and there we go. There's the bolt. And you can use that now in your CAD modeling. So a super handy website, you can download it, you can use it. Uh, Nuts as well, all different kinds of bolts, they all have the CAD available, all different types. I know the IGES one works. Uh, you could try the other ones that were listed. I think, what was it? EDRW, PDF doesn't work. Uh, SAT, SOLIDWORKS and the STEP files work best with SOLIDWORKS. So IGES, I know works, just use that. So let's do an example. Uh, these are some bolts I found in the shop. Uh, both of them are critical, I believe. This one is, it's kind of hard to see, it's 10.9, and this one is 12.9. It's a hex, and this one's a socket. So it's looking pretty good so far. And then the last one, the positive locking and the minimum two threads showing depend on the nut I put on the end of it. So, as far as I'm concerned, these could both be critical. Of course, they can be used in non-critical situations. Uh, I'll show the rule book actually first for that. If we look up fasteners, uh, you can go on 
to the new member drive, or to the new member guide, sorry. And I think it's on the first page, it says like what files I should look at. The rule book is one of them. We can scroll down to the fasteners section and it immediately gives you everything you need to know about critical fasteners. Let's find this bolt on McMaster. M12, 1.75 thread pitch, and there's a 60 and a 70. Uh, I'm guessing this is a 70, because if you look, this is kind of long, and this is a little bit shorter, so I'm betting this is 40 and this is 30. If it was even, it might be a 60. So I'm gonna go with 70. So let's go McMaster, give me a metric, M12, 12 millimeter diameter, 70 in length, it was a hex head, it was 1.75 thread. I can go and say it's partially threaded. That's good. Uh, I know it's 10.9 because it said 10.9 on the head. How about this guy? 70 partially threaded, coarse. It looks about right. Blue dyed zinc. I'd say that looks pretty blue dyed. I bet it's this guy. So I can go ahead, buy them in packs of five for 15 bucks. IGS or IGES, download. There we are. If you want to on your own time, there's the M8 1.25 by 40 socket. Uh, it's 12.9 is the uh, grade. Uh, you can try looking for that one yourself if you'd like. I think identifying them on the car is super important. Uh, for this first one, it's a little hard to see, but I'll say it. Uh, this is the pedal box, and in here are some fasteners, and it's a little bit difficult, but they have the nut and that little tapered cylinder thing, which means that they're nylocks. If I see nylocks, the first thing I'm thinking is, these are critical. But are the critical fasteners needed here? Thankfully, the rule book tells us, if I look up a uh, pedal box, maybe? Critical fasteners. Fasteners in the brake system are critical fasteners right there. T.3.1.10. And so whenever you're working on something, please, for the love of God, go <laughs> to the rule book and look up whatever you're, whatever you're doing. Use all different kinds of terminology. It might not be the same one you're looking for. I looked up pedal box. It's under brake system. Try to find it. And you'd find rules like this. If you didn't, if you didn't realize that that was a rule and you designed your thing with tiny little small bolts here, and at competition, you stomp on it, it breaks off, the judge screams at you, everyone hates you. <laughs> Don't do it. Use the real book and find these critical fasteners. Jacking point. So this is the jacking point. The jacking point is a bar on the back of the chassis where in the event that the car needs to be towed or lifted, uh, that jacking point is what we hook onto or pick the car up with. And there's a bolt here, but no nut. Took the nut off. Uh, so you can't tell if it immediately if it's a critical or not. And you're looking around the shop thinking, okay, do I need to make this critical? So when I look up jacking point, I see it under vehicle equipment, VE, 2.1. And none of these appear to have anything regarding critical fasteners or fasteners at all for that matter. Uh, I'm okay with putting a non-critical fastener nut on the end of it and calling it a day. A little surprising considering that it's a jacking point for the entire car, but whatever. What about suspension? Immediately I see nylock on these bolts, and if I go ahead and just look up suspension, suspension and steering under V.3, immediately in bold blue I see fasteners and the suspension system are critical fasteners. Everything needs to be critical in suspension. So that's why these guys are nylock. And on Mark IV, you'll see a little bit sometimes. A lot of them have fallen off, but we used to put red stickers on all the bolts and bolt holes that were critical. So that way, when you tightened it, you could visually conf like confirm this needs to be critical. It kind of failed because even if we missed one, if we missed a hole that was critical, we didn't put a sticker on it, people wouldn't make it critical. And then if it had a sticker on it but wasn't critical because it was a mistake, then people would make it critical. So. It didn't quite work, but you'll see them on Mark IV sometimes. This one is chassis. If you guys recognize that block, that was the one I showed you a drawing of last week. If I go ahead and look up, I'll use bolted sleeve, that's what it's called. Bolted connections in the primary structure chassis. 
must use removable bolt and nut, okay. Uh, threaded fasteners used in the primary structure, so a bolt is a critical fastener. Lo and behold, those have to be critical. And what about this guy? So these tabs are for the uh, rear wing. There's some carbon arms that come down, it holds up the rear wing, and they bolt here, and it has a nylock on it. Uh, I'm not sure if it needs a nylock, but I'll check. Bodywork and aerodynamic devices, sounds about right. Rear wing's one of those. I don't see anything about critical fasteners. Interesting, why does it have a nylock? Bodywork, it's not bodywork, it's part of the aerodynamics. I'm looking, I'm looking. I'm seeing the blue highlighted stuff, none of them say critical. So all I care about for fasteners would be here regarding the rear wing. Lo and behold, I don't see critical fasteners. That nylock shouldn't have been there. It actually caused a lot of issues, that one, because once you take a nylock off, that nylon on the inside is forever changed. Uh, and so once you try to put it back on, you have to put it on even tighter and tighter until eventually you just use it up and it's just no longer worth it really. Like it'll come off easier every single time that you take it off. So ideally you put it on once and you replace them if you have to take them off again. And the rear wing came off a lot during moving the car around and shipping and storage and whatnot. And this one just got utterly destroyed. It shouldn't have been a nylock. We could have went with a normal nut. Uh, some more, this one's for the seat. It is a thumb screw made of aluminum. Again, a pain in the butt, because especially if you put, like have uh, in the shop, we have magnetic trays. You can drop stuff in, it all stays there. Uh, those wouldn't, they just, buzz off if you moved it too much and we lost a lot of these, which sucked because they were expensive. They look really pretty. This guy is the headrest. It is not critical. It has just regular nuts on the back of it, which is surprising because it's a headrest for your head for like safety reasons, but whatever, it's not critical. It doesn't need nylocks. And this one is the uh, electrical grounding bolt. It has a tab onto the chassis. It's not considered critical. It doesn't need an nylock or anything. Uh, this one, what if you don't have a bolt to put through in the first place? This is the firewall and you need to look it up. What do we do? Oh my gosh, I don't know what bolt it needs. I'm not gonna do it, but you go to the rule book, you look it up and you find that the firewall doesn't need critical fasteners. Hence why I used aluminum thumb screws and they worked so poorly. Uh, the, I, def I tried getting as close as I could. You can tell like these, these are tiny holes. Um, and so an issue with getting something small to mount to the car is you have a tab like this, which is really, really thin. And when you have a really thin tab, you need um, threads on the inside that you can screw into to like lock in place. But if it's super, super thin, you'll probably strip them or just won't have enough grip, right? So what you do is you put a rivet through it, which is that kind of protruding thing. It sticks through like that. Uh, you can kind of see it has these ridges in it. They're put into the rivet so that it's weaker at that point. And that way when you tighten it, that portion of the rivet collapses on itself and it binds onto your really thin piece of metal. So that way you get your amount of thread that you need by making that longer. There was one in this photo as well. Uh, this one, instead of tightening it and it's squishing down, it's a weld nut, so it just has a really large flange at the top and you just weld it in place. Uh, other kind of fasteners on the car. Uh, this is for body work, so it's a super thin like sheet of steel uh, with a piece of plastic on the other end to make up for the extra junk. And it fits on with these nice handy uh, clips almost. I'm not sure what to call them. You put them in, you half turn them, that's all you need to do. They're also made of plastic, super light. And you need a lot of them to put the bodywork on. So that was a good one to have. Uh, Mark III used these guys, which are, uh, these are aluminum round, and then this is a steel, I think. And it just uses a Allen key to tighten it on. Uh, and there would be a thread on the other side of this plate, but it's really thin, so they get bent out of whack really easily, which is why we went to plastic one instead. So things to consider when you're doing stuff. How thin are you connecting things to? 
Am I going to drop it? Is it going to be critical? Uh, how strong does it need to be? Um, even if it isn't critical, do I still need a grade 12.9 bolt to make sure this thing doesn't move? This is the upper wing mount. So again, non-critical, uses a regular nut. Uh, and you can see it has one, two, three, four, five threads exposed. So minimum that we would want is two. And we're all about minimizing things, making performance gains. So something that we want to start doing this year, we have it in the past. Everything above these two threads is extra material. And really, we could just cut off the end of that bolt <laughs> because we don't need that anymore. And you'll just have the two threads showing the very minimum. Good to go. The rest of it can go. It's extra material. Who cares about that? Uh, sometimes other teams will go even further and they will drill a hole in the top of their bolt, like where this S is on this guy, it will drill a hole in it and take out material on the top face to make it even lighter. That's like shaving grams off. Like we're not there, but we want to be, and it'd be cool to just kind of start doing that. But anyway, um, this is an example of a imperial bolt. So no numbers or anything. The six lines indicate that's a grade eight bolt. You don't have to know that we're using metric this year, but that's an example. That's it for tonight. Thank you guys.